Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for a, a seminar that will be, I guess, I hope, uh, as provocative as it will be fascinating. First and foremost, I want to thank um, Maura Marvao, International Specialist Consultant at Philips, and Nuno Crespo, Dean of the Deans of uh, Escola des Artes at uh, Catolica University for associating Seralves to this uh, seminar, which is really the, the conversation that needs to happen at the moment. This is the conversation of the moment. I think you know the fact that you planned it the week after NFT and Bitcoin took a huge plunge, I think was very strategic. So we thank you for that as well. Um, as most of you, um, I'm here to learn. And I, I only have questions. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. My questions run around the, the following lines. What do a bored ape, Mona Lisa, and Madonna have in common? Is a crypto punk the cryptocurrency version of Warren Buffett? Why did Beeple NFT sold for $69 million? Is Beeple a genius, a crook, or both? Why can't I wear my $134,000 Nike NFT sneakers? Are NFT a currency? Would Yves Klein have produced an NFT zone of immaterial sensibility? Can a museum support its operation by selling NFT versions of Guernica or Mona Lisa? Are NFT just the next luxury good? Are NFT the future of art or the future of the art market? Are NFT an unregulated digital visual pollution open to speculation? What did come first, the NFT or the egg? <laughs> Is God an NFT? <laughs> Am I an NFT? And I hope you can answer all these questions, because I don't want to have the humiliation to ask my 10-year-old to answer. Thank you very much. I want to welcome Mara and, uh, and Nuno to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon. After this introduction, it's going to be difficult. Um, well, but first of all, I would like to thank the Sahal Foundation Board of Administration and the Museum Director, Philippe Verne, for welcoming this initiative. I would also like to thank the School of Arts of the Catholic University and its director, Nuno Crespo, for creating the concept of this seminar. The Center for Research in Science and Technology of the Arts, CITAR, and the Center for Digital Creativity, CCD, and its director, directors, both research units at the Catholic University. It was with great pleasure that Philips joined and supported this initiative. The topic of our seminar, Generative Art, has, it seems, suddenly come into the spotlight. I think one of the reasons for this is because it revolutionized the art market. The results that NFTs have obtained and the place they have been occupying in the market in recent years make this a very current and relevant topic to talk about. We are all interested in knowing more about them and in understanding this phenomenon that shook the art world coming seemingly out of nowhere to currently represent 16% of the global art market. We are also seeing the works of artists, namely the pioneers of generative art, some 70 years later being recognized both by institutions and traditional collectors. 
we will now have the opportunity to discuss all matters related to generative art, and for that we can count on a panel of specialists and crucial artists to whom I would like to thank their, present, their presence and their generosity in sharing their knowledge and experience with us. It will certainly be a very interesting conversation from which I am sure we will all come out more informed and enlightened. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And now I'm introducing Nuno Crespo. So, hello. Good afternoon, all of you. After the brilliant presentations by Maura and Philippe Fern, it's quite a difficult task to say something, but I will try. So, at the art schools, at the, art, the School of Arts at the Universidade Católica Portuguesa, we are focused in artistic research and, in particular, in the study and experimentation of new media and technologies applied to artistic creation and reflection. So, it is with very much, we are very much pleased to propose this program in partnership with Schalves and Philips to discuss, to discuss the place of generative art and NFTs and in contemporary art practices and its markets. Traditionally, the artworks are considered exclusive and of difficult access. But the recent trend towards NFTs has opened up not only the art markets, admitting new agents outside the traditional art scene, but also it means an expansion uh, of the artistic field, which has opened a vast, uh, a vast lack of possibilities for artists to create, research and develop their own practices. This market transformation has already been recognized by the main agents, collectors, and institutions in the world, such as Philips, Sotheby's, or Christie's, or Christie's auctioners, who have placed NFTs and generative art in their portfolio of the works they present to their clients. In the last year alone, the volume of transactions in markets and art collections associated with NFT uh, smart contracts has surpassed $40 billion in cryptocurrencies. We would like to take this interest, we at the school, you know, uh, to take this interest in art markets in this new art format, new, let's say what let, we will discover with Sofia Garcia, what does this new means, to think about the possibilities it might open to artists to diversify, diversify their means um, to access and engage not only with the art markets, but for us as an art school, and most importantly, to think how this new paradigm, um, uh, how this new paradigm means an opportunity to find new forms, shapes, and processes of artistic creation. Generative arts and NFTs have captured the attention of investors and most have been trading for hundreds and thousands of dollars, if, as, I, as we have been mentioning. But what is exactly generative art, as Philippe was asking? How does, it uh, is, how does it articulate with NFTs? And what does this mean to the art market? Will there be a mass adoption of NFTs by market, museums, curator, or they will suffer a long-term rejection? This afternoon seminars, which we hope will be the first of many, we will try to answer these questions, or at least to begin to try to find their, their answers. For us at the school, it is a very important occasion, uh, especially because we develop in our programs in uh, new media art, both in bachelor, masters, and the PhD, these kind of questions. But also because we have been working and developing it, as Maura has mentioned, in our research centers, CITAR and CCD, this kind of work. Finally, I would like to thank the two institutions that have made, that ma that have made this evening uh, possible. First of all, I would like to thank the Sahalves Museum of Contemporary Art in the person of its director, Philippe Vergne. Thank you very much, Philippe, for hosting this session, and also to the president of the board, Dr. Anne Pin. And I would like to thank uh, also, Philips, in the person of Maura Mervaux, international specialist and representative for Portugal and Spain, that has embraced this seminar and this idea immediately with their, uh, uh, all, uh, with their, 
very known enthusiasm and energy. This is not, not the first time we have partnered in, in creating a moment of discussion. We have made something together here at this auditorium two years ago with Francesco bon, bon, Bonami. But tonight we want to create a moment of discussion around the articulation of art markets and contemporary art practices. And I'm certain that we will have that opportunity here uh, this afternoon with us. I would like to say uh, a special thanks to Benjamin Candler and Sofia Garcia for having helped us design this program. They immediately em embarked in this, in this adventure and bring, brought all these amazing artists and people to Porto this afternoon. So, without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker today, that is Benjamin Candler, and he will talk about the, uh, his talk uh, is uh, as the title, The Art Markers. Benjamin Candler is a private sales assistant and NFT coordinator, coordinator sorry, at Philips. He holds a degree in art history from Goldsmith University of London. Mr. Candler has worked in several art institutions, such as the Barbican Center, Moniker Art Fair, Corvid Mora Gallery, among many others. He has worked with artists, students, and in the articulation Articulation Prize to increase the participation in art history as a discipline and the arts in general as a field. After uh, Benjamin Candler presentation, we'll make a short break of 10 minutes to have a, a, a wine, and then the following speaker will be uh, Sofia Garcia, uh, with, which will deliver a lecture on the history of generative art. Over the last six years, Ms. Garcia has become, has become a reference in the generative art space as a curator, counselor, and a community builder. Ms. Garcia uh, was honored with Apollo Magazine's 40 Under, Under 40 in Art Plus Tech Business as founder uh, of the magnificent project Art X Code a generative art house. She currently serves on the Art Blocks Board of Trustees and is also an advisor to the company. She previously worked at GP Onyx um, uh, Morgan as a blockchain te technical design strategist and as the director of Code Art Education, a nonprofit focused on teaching girls to make art with code. Thank you all for your presence here this afternoon, and, we, and I hope sincerely that we can not only widen up our knowledge about these new art formats, but also to be able to find today here the, per the perfect spot to open an intense, an intense discussion about the important transformations we are witnessing in the art of our times. Thank you very much. Benjamin, the floor Thank you, Nuno, for that lovely introduction. Uh, so I'm Benjamin Candler. I work in private sales, and I'm also the digital art lead for Philips Auction House, uh, based in London. And so today I'm kind of going to run through what Philips has been doing in terms of digital art, uh, even slightly before my time at the auction house, and then moving forward, kind of what we're looking for and what we're kind of focusing on in terms of strategy and a bit of market insight and then towards the end if anyone has any questions about the market or the art kind of historical side or just any crazy random questions feel free to shoot them over and we'll also kind of run through our upcoming ex machina sale which will uh, show about 50 historic works both nft and generative uh, from the 1950s through to present day so Philips, slightly before my time, there was a, I have a colleague called Rebecca Bowling who kind of ushered digital art and, and NFTs into the auction house. Um, and she embarked on this adventure with an amazing artist, Canadian artist called Mad Dog Jones, uh, producing this work with Replicator. Um, and Replicator itself is kind of a short loop of a video, uh, clearly of, of a photocopy machine, but it also is kind of a real um, in kind of interrogation of smart contract art and the possibilities of it. Um, and so we, we kind of have a photocopy machine and it produces different outcomes and the work itself replicates over and over again. Um, and within that work, there's the possibility for it to keep replicating um, for, forever. So if a collector holds the work, they'll be given additional works. 
um, and this will kind of continue on. There is an element of chaos in this work, which I love, and uh, that's like with most photocopiers, if you work in an office, you know, they jam, which is very frustrating and can often ruin the work. Uh, and so within the piece, as, as kind of the work produces itself at random, uh, a burn mechanic within the smart contract can destroy the art. So if the work produces two outcomes and then four outcomes and six outcomes, the next time you know, one might be reduced, you might get a ton more, some more. And so there is a, a real act of randomness within the work, which is, is quite beautiful. And at the time of the sale back in April, um, it, the work sold for $4.1 million, which kind of uh, just, just shows kind of how incredible it was and also the market at that time. Um, and it also set the record for, it made Mad Dog Jones at the time, um, the most expensive living oh. Canadian artist, uh, and that's across contemporary art and it, it, the whole the whole art market, which was was really something. And then, kind of shortly after our foray into replicator, we also looked at uh, Sarah Mirhas's uh, Bitcoin series, and so Sarah Mirhas um, kind of plays with the idea of, of tokenomics, currency, um, kind of the economy and capitalism at scale, but also. Uh, the possibilities of kind of blockchain technology when it's integrated with art. And so she started this project way back in, in 2015, which actually predates the Ethereum blockchain, which kind of just shows how much of a, an OG she is. Um, and then what, what she did later, in um, about six years after, so in 2021, when we had the sale, she migrated uh, the Bitcoin project to the Ethereum blockchain, and she backed uh, each, each Bitcoin itself with a rose petal. Um, and so kind of playing with the idea of you know, almost currency being pegged to a dollar or having a physical backing of some kind, which is kind of now super popular, but at the time was, was revolutionary. And what she did is she had a, a kind of a set supply to kind of create scarcity. So she had 3,291 Bitcoins, um, and, and we were very fortunate to receive 480 of those, uh, which we, we sold in bundles. And again, we kind of were at the time, really uh, kind of differentiating ourselves, uh, ourselves from the other auction houses, I guess, with a slightly more conceptual approach, kind of looking more to smart contract art and generative art. Um, and that kind of leads, up, leads us up to where we are now, which is kind of ex machina, which is kind of the evolution of, of our interest in generative art at the auction house and likely what we're going to be focusing on pretty much uh, moving forward. And so the ex machina sale came together about six or seven months ago with a Swiss curator and advisor called Georg Back. Uh, he's a specialist in generative photography um, and really just a master and yeah, just a fountain of knowledge when it comes to works, uh, especially from the 50s and 60s and 70s. And we decided we wanted to put on a, a historic uh, auction, but also an exhibition which we open to the public and really educate both the collectors um, and, and, the, and the public alike about the kind of history of generative art, how it started, where it's going to, um, and kind of possibilities for the future as well. And so we've collected about 50 works, and they start in the 1950s with pioneers like Herbert W. Franke. We have works by Vera Molnar, uh, Vladimir Bonacek, and we also have more contemporary works um, by artists like Snowfrow. And so here we have uh, the Chromie Squiggle, which some of you might be familiar with. It's kind of one of the most popular examples of, of, of generative art and kind of one of the most playful, um, kind of the poster child for, for generative art. And the Chromie Squiggle is, um, was the first project on art blocks, which Snowfrow, also known as Eric Calderon, also founded. Um, and so the process for creating a Chromie Squiggle is uh, Eric himself produced a set number of variables um, which, which he controlled, and they, I'll show you some of those because I think it's also great with kind of generative art. It's, it's cool to see one, but actually when you see a set of them, you really understand kind of the breadth of the algorithm and uh, all the different variations and kind of randomness that can occur. And so with Chromie Squiggles, I think it's a great thing to, to explore because they're very simple, they're very playful, um, but also they can get quite complex and people often have favorites. Um, mine are the kind of ribbed, the hyper ribbed and the slinkies. Um, and, and depending on kind of their characteristics, they also have varying degrees of rarity. And so Eric plugged in several different um, variations which could possibly occur when the project was uh, first released. So, you know, there's the possibility of slinkies, hyperbolds, and th these may only occur a few times or several times, like the standard works, which you can see 60% or 61% of them kind of have. And then the way this work is kind of produced, it doesn't exist until someone actually purchases it. So 
that algorithm kind of, in a way, plays with the hash transaction key, and that in turn produces the different outcomes. So until the work is bought, no one knows what they're going to get. It's kind of a very democratic and interesting way to create art, both with the collectors and also with the public. And you don't know what you're going to get, which is, which is brilliant. And then people can trade them, obviously. I think a lot of people tend to keep them, um, especially within generative art collecting. Everyone I know that's quite serious about it has one or 10 or 100. Like They are just the thing you have to get. And so we have a chromie squiggle on our show, which I thought would be also a great way to start the exhibition and really introduce people into the possibilities of it. So then we also have in this, uh, this exhibition, we have a work by Distributed Gallery, who are a collective of uh, engineers, hackers, artists, um, uh, coders, and they're all anonymous. And what they did in 2018 was create something called the Chaos Machine, which I absolutely love, and it is pure chaos. So the Chaos Machine, the way it works, um, is essentially you put fiat currency, if you can believe it, right into this little slot here. Um, it drops down into the chamber, and then it has these kind of metal grids at the bottom, almost like a toaster. It immediately sets fire to the work, um, and in doing so, in doing so, basically spits out a song out of, out of the speaker system and then prints out a QR code. And that QR code, uh, if you scan it, allows you, it registers on the blockchain and allows you to register a song on the blockchain. Um, and the next time someone uses it, that song will be played and that song will be there forever. So it's a real kind of interesting take on blockchain art and the, the possibilities of it. There's also two of these works. And if any song plays on one machine, it plays on the, same mach the second machine um, at the same time. I've actually got a short video, if you guys could play it. Um, which kind of illustrates how the work. The chaos machine is clearly quite chaotic, um, but it's also thinking about it recently, I guess, with the current market uh, and the state of cryptocurrency, there's something uh, quite beautiful about the fact, I guess, that the kind of group of anarchists decided, what are we talking, like four, four or five years ago now, that um, you know, smart contracts, people, there's now a real culture, which I've, I've noticed, and, and a shift, I guess, in collecting, especially generative art, that people 
have completely shifted away from kind of traditional currency, uh, fiat currency, and collecting in the traditional way. And people now, you know, solely live with kind of smart contract art, uh, cryptocurrency, and it's becoming more and more popular to live your life with that. And this work is, I guess, an illustration of that of that transition. So we also have uh, slightly, well, equally chaotic, but slightly more uh, simplistic uh, works aesthetically. Um, and so it's a pioneer called Vera Molnar. She's Hungarian. Um, she's super cool, and she is 98, and she actually um, was representing Hungary in the Venice Biennale this year. So she's having a bit of a breakout moment, which is, is long overdue. And uh, we're super fortunate to have a work called Disorderous. Um, so Vera uh, has been making works going back sort of 50, 60 years now, and uh, you know she, she was essentially making works at the same time as kind of the minimalist and the conceptualist. Uh, Lewitt, I guess, is, is a good comparator, um, and really didn't get kind of the attention she deserved or the publicity she deserved, and is now now having a breakout moment. But her her process for kind of creating generative works. Um, back in the late 60s, uh, she was part of the uh, research lab at the Sorbonne University um, and she got her hands on a computer and would just sit there endlessly kind of inputting ones and zeros over and over and over and over again trying to get different kind of aesthetic outputs. Um, this work is super unique in that it's five metres long and it comes with nine different plotter drawings kind of spread out um, and a work of this size is never ever come to market before. Uh, there's a few institutions that have kind of similar works, but none have ever been, um, been sold off or, or of anyone's ever had the opportunity to purchase them. Um, and the process for this work is, is super simple. So you have five squares by five squares, uh, creating 25 squares within. And with each work, uh, Vera constantly, and with all her work she has done for the last 60 years, she constantly plays with this, this idea of kind of chaos and order and the interaction between that aesthetically um, and lives her life very systematically every day, creating order, creating chaos, kind of the pay and the interaction between those two concepts. Um, and with this work you can kind of see in, in the first output she makes, it's fairly simple, it's quite kind of symmetrical, this one even more so, slight overlap and you have density in corners, this one's super uniform and kind of uh, you know, very aesthetically appealing, and then classic Vera, you have this kind of chaotic moment, um, and line kind of just dances across the page. Um, and so, yeah, this this work is is absolutely fantastic, and also it shows uh, a bit like the Chromie Squiggles. Um, at the time, none of these artists had the ability to kind of make art non fungible or produce them as a token or share them. Um, you know, publicly or have the public be able to view them in the same way you can now with the blockchain and, and distributed technology. And so, you know, if you think about someone 60 years ago, literally, I would go crazy sitting there just inputting code every single day and kind of getting these crazy outputs. Um, and now it's not easier, but, you know, it's, uh, you can also be a lot more flexible with stuff and add colour in. Um, back then, you literally had to put in code. If you had access at the time to a plotter, you could then kind of push it out through that and then have a pen meticulously execute the work. Uh, and if you messed up, that was it. You had to restart all over again and weeks of work were, were, were gone. And then kind of the final work I'll talk about from the exhibition is, is Vladimir Bonacek's work, which is, well, a good point before this is when I was putting the show together, I wanted a complete breadth of medium. So sculpture, installation, and we have photography, obviously of NFTs and different types of NFTs. Um, but I love uh, Bonacek's work. So, it's almost like a strobe light, kind of very rave type energy, and, and it spits out these different kind of light patterns over and over and over again. Um, and, and this work, which was, which was made in the late 60s again, so a similar time to Vera Molnar, um, Bonacek was really playing with this idea of, of aesthetics, living with computers and the interaction between technology and art and the possibility of output, and, um, and, and it's, it's particularly with, within kind of everyday medium. So this is made of uh, these small glow lamps, you have this kind of uh, kind of cross hatch. It's actually made of these small uh, kind of square tubes that are all kind of meticulously put together. And on the back of the work, uh, you have a little kind of switch, almost like you get on like, uh, like an amplifier, which you can turn up and off, and it literally has like uh, a domestic on and off switch and this crazy transistor to, to keep everything together. And what you can do is increase the frequency that outputs uh, are created, varying from, I believe, 0.7 to 5 seconds. Um, and every time you will get a different pattern. So the computer just keeps on giving you these different signs um, in and out. They're absolutely beautiful, kind of put you in a trance almost. Um, and 
with these works, I've actually got it here, I believe it's the same pattern. If you keep it on the two second row, the same pattern won't be created again. Assuming, you know, we all have energy in that amount of time, I'd, I'd hope. Um, but you won't see the same pattern produced again for 270 years, which is uh, just incredible. So it's a work that, I guess, a bit like the Mad Jones, just keeps on, keeps on creating itself until eventually it, it, it breaks or destroys itself. Um, yeah, so, and then I guess the other thing to talk about is um, obviously kind of auction houses are moving into the NFT space and kind of the market outlook uh, for, the, for the next few years. And one of the things we've kind of discussed at Philips and is kind of inherent to our values is always being on the cutting edge of kind of contemporary art. We always have been, um, hopefully we always will be. And, you know, we, we've been, we often get off get off with board apes and kind of all these PFP projects, which are cool and they have a moment. Um, but ultimately to me, generative art is the natural art historical progression um, from the work from the 50s and 60s and 70s. Um, and so from an auction house perspective, we recognize that we have influence in bringing stuff to market. And it's really important that we shine a spotlight on, on kind of these earlier artists and also work with artists directly, which we rarely get to do as an auction house. That's only secondary. So being able to work with us directly to either make works, especially for auctions, um, or even just source really unique pieces um, that are out there and you know, have the opportunity to show kind of leading, uh, lead, leading digital art is something that we're focused on. And another, yeah, a point about this exhibition is it's also particularly unique because it will be on, in, um, on view in Paris for two weeks, opening on the 30th of May. Um, and we kind of encourage the public to go in. There'll be kind of educational talks and it'll also be on view for a month, for the whole month of July on our, on our London premises. Again, with some of the artists talking themselves, um, kind of academics coming in, and then also curators giving tours and that sort of thing. So yeah, I'll open up the floor to any questions anyone might have about the art market or the NFT market or uh, the market as a whole. Or if nobody's got any questions, we can move on to the break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Benjamin, for your very, very inspiring presentation. Well, I have, my question is more provocative than a real question. So, what, in, terms of, in terms of what we imagine, and I think that uh, after the break with Sofia, Marcel, William, Iskra, and Monica, we will d go deeper on this, but what we, have, what we have showed us are material art objects. So, uh, and when we imagine digital art, we imagine something that is immaterial, that is not tangible, etc. So, uh, and I think that on, on our heads, uh, we would like, if you can, of course, elaborate a little bit more how does an auction house such as Philips works with such an inten intangible, invisible uh, thing such, a, as, such as a, a, an NFT or, or a code that is inside a computer etc so yeah i mean i think it's a few things there so even with um nfts which are i guess intangible and you imagine them as kind of not being a physical thing someone behind that has had to code that through a physical machine and so generative art at its core is about that interaction between machine and human um, and the kind of acts of randomness and automation that can happen sometimes uh, out of choice sometimes not so much out of choice and so i think as an auction house we, you know, for hundreds of years, we focused on mainly physical works, and that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, but, you know, NFTs are also unique for us in that they're fairly, in some ways, much easier to deal with. You don't have to ship stuff uh, and insure stuff and all kind of the complex logistics that come with that. Um, 
but also you can do some, some really funky things with them. So if you want to show a work you know, simultaneously all over the world, if you want to have one here, if you want to have one in the auction house, in a collector's house, um, you can seamlessly beam that over. And so I guess us, us evolving and, and kind of engaging with the play between physical and NFT, there, there are loads of possibilities. I mean, but the thing I try and stress is that this, this work hasn't just come out of nowhere, it hasn't just existed uh, intangibly and kind of turned up on the blockchain. Someone spent, uh, as probably here in the artist panel, uh, you know, weeks, months and, and years tapping away behind a computer physically uh, in a very manual way, kind of practicing and putting inputs. And um, yeah, and I, and I think with all, with all digital art, it's, it's very hard to see the practice behind it because it does so seamlessly uh, exist online in the digital, but there's always a physical component to that, and it's important to showcase that physical interaction. <laughs> As usual, the first question is always the, the artist. <laughs> I'm very curious that there is also, besides this this first question, your main, well, I'm not asking for the name of the client, but your main clients are private clients that usually uh, work in the trade. Well, how are museums such as uh, contemporary art museums such as Ralph's Museum, the Tate, MoMA, etc., which has been our 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 guidance into the new trends in contemporary art, contemporary art dealing with these new art forms? How are they showing? Are they buying, or is just a thing? Because it, for us that are outside this, this new market, it seems that as if generative art and NFTs is a question of uh, specu uh, financial speculation. So how are art institutions working or reacting to these proposals that you, that you are making? Yeah, well, there's a few things there. So I mean, the, the, the question I always pose if I meet people kind of in, in more public institutions is, uh, wouldn't it make your life a lot easier if you didn't have to conserve stuff and ship stuff and uh, put stuff in storage and back again? And most of them, I'm sure, would be, would be very happy with that. So, I mean, th there's been some resistance for, from kind of institutions, and that's understandable because we are in a movement and often works aren't shown by public institutions until after the moment's happened. Um, so there's that. But there's also new types of institutions popping up, uh, especially in the metaverse. We have kind of online viewing rooms and galleries. Um, and they, the type of client actually is really transitioning as well. So there's a lot of interest from kind of traditional collectors, institutional collectors, galleries, private you know, collectors, but you also have collectors of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, who themselves are forming um, kind of an acquisition network. So instead of having, you know, a, a board of trustees who particularly uh, pick to acquire stuff, you have these kind of new DAOs which, which choose to make acquisitions. And they themselves are building, um, like Punk 6529 is quite popular, you know, they're building enormous uh, virtual museums um, and, and acquiring digital works for that. And then, I guess it's less uh, digital, well, digital in a way, but of the physical works. So, for instance, the V&A has one of the largest collections of genital art in the world. Um, you know, collect dozens and dozens of, of Herbert Frankers and, and Bonacics, and actually the Tate, um, the Tate and MoMA both also have quite um, interesting uh, kind of collections of digital art, mainly from the 50s and 60s uh, up until kind of the 90s. But I think in the future we will see a lot more museums engaging with digital art purely itself as a medium. But there's also a lot of hurdles, as you said, there's speculation, what do you pick, how do you know something's going to stick forever. Um, and I think for more contemporary museums who are up for doing something a little bit funky or a little bit newer or a bit experimental, the best thing is to work with artists directly or commission them um, because you take away that idea of the market and the financialization kind of attached to it and you, know, you can let the artist completely experiment. So I think that's the way forward for institutions is, is commissioning works and then taking that into their permanent collections. I have a, a pure market question. Okay. Um, because if we follow the, the market evolution of NFTs over the last couple of years, I think it really came to the general uh, um, awareness rather recently, even though there is a, a long history of this experimentation. But how do you, I mean, if you sell, um, like, um, 
a Mark Grogan painting or uh, a Louis XVI uh, chair, you do market analysis, you do uh, a fair estimate, market estimate based on a series of uh, 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 constellation of information. How do you assess the value of an NFT when it reaches the the, uh, the auction block? Um, and I think everybody was extremely surprised when uh, actually people, uh, I think a year ago or a little less now, sold for a stratospheric amount of money. We have a lot of conversation saying, well, okay, it's, uh, it's insider trading, it's uh, uh, the buyer is part of, you know, the same industry, it's crypto, you know, they're the crypto billionaires just, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, raising the value of their own uh, investment. But uh, basically, I mean, a lot of what we see values are so high that even to your question of how do institutions get involved, if, it, if we follow what you describe, I mean, it's very hard for us. But what, how, like when an NFT comes to the market, what are the measures that you follow to give it a value? Yeah, so there are a few different ways we do it. My personal favorite is set something at $100 and see what happens because it's worth what somebody's willing to pay for it and that's the fairest and most democratic way. Um, whilst that's great, like we saw with the people, there are crazy market moments when uh, markets are super high, they're, you know, they're volatile and two people go crazy and bid super high, which is great for an auction house, but maybe not great for a market. Um, and then you might see that crash down again. So that's one thing. And then when it comes to kind of placing estimates on work, I think there's more parallels with the traditional art market than people care to appreciate. And so the, one of the brilliant things about digital art, especially NFTs, you know, it's very open source. So you can look at prices in real time. It's incredibly transparent. Uh, you can go on OpenSea, look at the provenance, which is again, a big problem for auction houses. It's there. It says, what it says to the minute what time it was created on, who had it first, who's had it since, who's transferred it, essentially from which wallet to which wallet. Um, and you can also see transactions going through, right? So with a, a Warhol or something, you know, you might only get market updates every few months after an auction's happened, or through a, a dealer, or if something's coming primary. Whereas with NFTs, you can just go on OpenSea and see what the fair market price is for that really particular subset of a series. Uh, you know, if there's a particular color out of 10,000 works, why is that color valued? Um, people are also really transparent on Twitter, so you can also ascertain why people value things, and that kind of comes into play. Um, and then I guess the other way to, to kind of price stuff is, you know, there's cultural and historical significance, the same you have with traditional works. And so if a work is of an institutional museum grade, naturally it's gonna command a higher estimate because it's, it's more important, as the same you would with a, with a traditional artwork. Especially with some of these early NFTs, especially like Sermio has works, um, the Chaos Machine, the Frankers, the Molnars, these are historical works, so they, they command a high estimate. Whereas with the Chromie Squiggle, um, which has been consigned also by the artist directly, um, you know, he was like, let's set the price as low as possible and see what happens, and that's kind of my, my, my favorite approach. Um, but then there are moments of chaos, like it, it's an auction, and that's great, and uh, you know, stuff lands on what it lands on. Um, the best you can do is, is price stuff kind of conservatively and and uh, yeah, that's that's the fairest way to do it. But moments of madness happen as it happens in the traditional art market as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm just curious um, <clears throat> about this, this physical artworks you showed us. Is there a connection to tokens, to NFTs, to non-fungible tokens? For example, are you minting um, certificates of ownership? That way, for example, uh, a physical piece can be as certifiably as possible. Um, transparent in uh, dealings on the market, in conditioning, etc. That That's one question, if there's a connection or if there's still a big separation uh, between those. And 
a different type of question is about the token itself because we're considering digital art uh, as the process, art that's basically digitally created, but the token is a, a digital output. And me personally, I don't see a great value in the token as an art piece, but only as a vehicle, a symbolic representation or, of something. For example, the certificate of ownership, a smart contract, something that does indeed produce a different intricacy, because otherwise we're going to go in that, those contradictions that uh, Frankfurt School wrote about six years ago. So that's a two-part question, if you could just yeah. enlighten me. So the first part is, yes, we are definitely exploring ideas of kind of uh, using smart contracts in the blockchain to track provenance. Um, we've actually got a sale coming up next month with uh, a, a car brand, Aspre uh, with Bugatti. It's also in partnership with Asprey, um, where they're creating physical works, which is then tied to the token. Um, and in fact, uh, the smart contract itself allows you to gain control of the physical work. So there is, there is an interaction there. And um, I think in the future, it's definitely the way it's going. You know, tracking provenance can be a, a, an absolute nightmare. And so it makes complete sense um, to use it as, as a vehicle to track provenance. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I, I guess the only problem is, you know, you still have human error. So if you have a physical work and uh, an NFT, if someone decides and you sell the, the NFT, some, you know, the physical can get lost, right? That's like the beauty of the blockchain, it never gets lost. So assuming there's no human error, which to some level there always will be, um, it's a flawless system. But I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of having the two living harmoniously, making sure that people always transfer the physical or people have the physical and they don't know how to transfer the NFT. Um, and then could you elaborate again on the second question? Sorry. For example, the first work you showed us, that was a digital output. Yep. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, the yeah, the printing yep. machine, the replicator. That's it. You you were careful enough not to show us the video because this artwork belong belongs to somebody. And uh, when in the olden days, when we had an artwork, it was our choice as the owners to either show it, sell it. It, the the aesthetic or the fruition experience of someone was determined by whoever owned it or had control of it. Nowadays, that's not. I could have basically the aesthetic experience of this artwork that you didn't show, but you told us what it was right now, if you chose to. Uh, and there's not that. I don't see really the. That's what I was trying to, to come into. If the NFT is the symbol, the process, the contract, whatever, I see value in that, not specifically in the artwork. For example, Beeple's, um, Beeple's art uh, is that in itself. And it's, it's difficult for me to grasp um, so like how the market, how our institutions, our, our critics are are seeing exactly uh, the value in an NFT. That's the digital output. Is it clear yeah. now? Yeah, I, I think I think so. So I mean, I, I guess one of the things that NFTs have allowed is is proof of ownership, right? And this is just constant debate of kind of the right click save and. You know, you you can go uh, to the Louvre and take a photo of the Mona Lisa, right? And you can say you own the Mona Lisa, you can have it printed out, you can have a, a, a copy uh, made of the work, right? But you still don't actually own the work. And so I guess for some people, I mean, yeah, and it, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because there's also, it's great in a way that you can see everyone's artworks, everything's transparent, you can see every output. Um, and it's the internet, right? So you can also be anonymous. So just because your work's on view doesn't mean anyone knows you necessarily own it. There's also ways, of course, if you, if you are so inclined um, to kind of add layers of anonym, um, anonymity, yeah, become more anonymous in, in, in the way you hold works. Um, but I think it's also one of the best things about NFTs and the movement as a whole is transparency. And there's a lot of critiques on the traditional art world for works being held up in storage units or being a storage of museums and never seeing the light of day. And actually, there's something quite nice that these works are always on view and will always be on view, assuming those 
blockchains you know uh, uh, keep running and uh, yeah i mean you know it's it's not for everyone which i get and it's also early days and we've moved a lot even two or three years ago to now uh, works are getting more complex um we're actually seeing more kind of in real life versions of works being produced uh, alongside kind of just digital aspects um yeah i mean if you if you you know it, it's, it's kind of at the way of the collector you know some people like to collect things just to have things some people also want to collect the story and so there's real value to them of being able to say look i own this i'm willing to share it but i own it myself and i can do what i want with it and you can you know you have control over those works um does that isn't it purely a market value what you just described as in the value of my possession is only dictated but by what I paid for and what someone down the line might be willing to pay for it. I mean, that's why I say there's quite a lot of similarities with the art market, right? Yes, in a way, market value can be determined by literal supply and demand. But, you know, there's also works that people don't want to sell and there's works that have never been sold. So it's very hard to determine the value on them. Um, and then there's also works that are made you know, as I said, you know, people commission works which have no market value necessarily at all, like you have for a public acquisition. Um, yeah, it's a constant play with NFTs. There is market value and there's speculation and that happens and that happens in every market, but, you know, people sometimes just collect and never sell. They just want to have those things forever and they're willing to share them and preserve them, but, you know. I guess my qualm is, is with... Um scarcity yeah and it's uh, there is scarcity you produce you mint as many nfts as you want to you can mint one and there's only one there's not real scar scarcity in in the experience and until we fully developed into a metaverse abiding species i don't see how this uh, uh, it doesn't really make sense for me uh, how um, how there's uh, value either, uh, I understand the market value because it's derived purely by the price of it, but uh, artistic, cultural, human value in it until we, we develop the tools to code everything in our lives and then we experience what the code tells us to. I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's a good point, but I mean, in some ways, uh, NFTs can be more scarce than traditional art, right? So if you have a living artist and they work on a series and they say, I'm only gonna make a thousand outputs, you know that's like you know the algor it's algorithm. You cannot make more than a thousand outputs. That is to be on end or like that scarcity is predetermined forever. Whereas with the physical artist, you know they could say I'm only going to make a hundred paintings. They have to live. They live to 120, you know, and they are throwing out editions of 100 every single day for the rest of their life. Surely that's more. Uh, you know, there's a greater supply than you would with some NFT artists. And also, I think you're seeing now. I'm sure the artist will attest to is. Um, with kind of more blue chip regenerative NFTs, people spend months and months and months and then might only release a thousand works, uh, you know, once or twice a year. And actually, you know, a lot of collectors collect multiple works from that series. And so the works become increasingly more scarce over time. And so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon. I just want to ask you, what, what do you think is art today, maybe? Just in general? Yes, for, <laughs> for you today. For you today. The view today. God, the million dollar question. Uh, well, you know, this has been debated for hundreds of years. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not going to answer it in, uh, in uh, you know, 10 minutes. But, um, you know, art today is, is f for me, art is anything that allows you to see the world in a different way. And that takes, you know, a multitude of aesthetics, mediums, perceptions, and that varies also wildly by culture, language, uh, taste, education, uh, so many different things. For me personally, um, you know, as I said, it's, it's anything that lets me see the world in a different way. That could be the form of digital art and NFTs. Uh, that could be, you know, 1960s Italian design. Uh, that could be installation. That could be painting. Um, I think, it, I think it's any, anything that people assign some kind of aesthetic value or, or, or kind of quality to and allows them to perceive someone else's view of the world in a different way. And yeah, I just, do you mean specifically also to, for generative art and NFTs or just art in? 
Art in general. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That would be that would be my concise my concise definition, uh, and, and any kind of you know aesthetic purpose that allows you to view the world in a different way that you couldn't before. How how would you uh, define art? <laughs> Okay, it's difficult, but um, I will see the aesthetic part in the art. So everything, well, that changed a lot over the years. Now it's another period, etc. But it's difficult for me to understand all this new art, to find the beauty in it. So that's why, and then you speak about the market, so I get lost with this. I'm, I'm sorry about my question, maybe it's not. Uh... No, I mean, so I guess for, yeah, and, and it's, it's a very, uh, a question I get a lot about how do you um, find those aesthetics in digital art because they can either seem quite redundant or simple or not very thought out. Um, but I guess m much like, you know, an old master painting, the skill is the technique and the complexity of the code um, and the aesthetic decisions to make one output and not another. Um, you know, to, to choose one colour and one variation over another, to choose one line or, or density or or population of a work. And I, I think it's all about kind of seriality. And you saw it in, uh, I briefly said in Vera Molnar's art, it's making those decisions between chaos and order and the interaction of that. And especially with smart contracts um, and coding and especially art blocks projects, you know, there's no margin for error. So you, these aesthetics, uh, these aesthetic kind of considerations have to be perfect, incredibly thought out, and then technically executed through code perfectly as well. So something like a Chromie Squiggle, which seems fairly simple and just like a little kind of colourful signature, the, the, the kind of the thought behind those aesthetics and then the skill of technique, I guess, is what gives it value and importance. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the market sometimes follows when stuff is particularly important. but. I guess to that point as well, it's something like a Beeple, which I'm not the biggest fan of, per like personally, um, doesn't have that much thought behind it. Whereas slightly, or the seeming seemingly kind of simpler works often have a lot of thought and concept behind them. Um, and over time, as the market matures and as we're seeing at the moment, those people who hold or collect or are interested or engage with the works that. Uh, um, are defined more by the skill of the code and the conceptual sensibility will shine through and be there in the long term. Thank you so much cool. for your presentation. Thank you for the question. So we'll make a very short break. And after, I think it's a, the perfect point to make a break because after we will return with Sofia Garcia that will give us a broad uh, historical development and then we will have the discussions with the artists that will tell us where's the beauty in the code. <laughs> <laughs> Marcelo Rod uh, Rodrigo Garcia, William Manei, Paniskra Velichkova. I did it? Well, cool. And Monica Rizolin, thank you so much for being here. So let's have some wine and, and return in 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Here. My name is Sofia Garcia, and I'm going to cover a brief history of generative art. There we go. Okay, so a series of 10,000 algorithmically generated rainbow squiggles has become one of the most celebrated artworks among the NFT community. From the outside, understandably, the appreciation for the chromy squiggle may seem absurd, but this unassuming icon of, represents a coming of age story for an artistic practice that has largely been dismissed by the mainstream art audience since its inception in 1960, generative art. So what is generative art? In the NFT ecosystem, the term generative art typically lends itself to describe any artwork that has been procedurally generated with an algorithm. Under this contemporary vernacular, the term is synonymous with digitally native work. However, according to scholars and theorists, generative art can be applied to any instance where an artist deliberately relinquishes control, either partially or fully, to a functional process or system. Uh, the term generative art simply Ref, uh, refers to how the art is made and the method is independent from any particular technology. 
A prime example of generative art under this broad definition is Islamic tiling, where artisans follow intricate rule-based systems to generate geometric designs. Uh, this classification does provide an interesting dilemma uh, for the taxonomy of generative art produced with a computer, because regardless of the symbiotic relationship between the term computer and generative, a computer is not required to create or execute a generative artwork. So for the sake of this discussion, um, we will be talking about a specific subset of generative art referred to as algorithmic art. And in this case, uh, it's any instance where the artist deliberately relinquishes control, either partially or fully, to an algorithm they have written uh, to produce a work of art. That looks something like this. So this is an example of an algorithm written by Monica Rizzoli. Uh, we'll, we'll be speaking to her a little bit later. And this, just a portion of this, uh, this algorithm, you see different functions that all, this algorithm produces each one of these artworks and seemingly infinite amount. So how did we get here? Uh, how did we get to buying art on the browser and being okay with it? Uh, the story of algorithmic art begins at the convergence of innovations taking place across art, science, and mathematics in the 20th century. Leading up to the 1960s, art movements like cubism, futurism, constructivism, and data presented a newfound dedication to geometry, abstraction, and chance, with a growing emphasis on technology, machine aesthetics, and mechanized production. There's also the rise of conceptualism with Solowit, the idea that the idea is the art, uh, grounded in Duchamp and his ready-mades. In the 1950s, uh, we see the rise of using analog computers to create artwork, and one of the first artists to do this was Ben Lepowski. He used a, a cathode rate oscillator to create abstract artwork using a, a long, long exposure photography. Uh, and Towards, towards the end here, he started adding filters so he could add some colors to that, but he was a mathematician by trade, and this was really a precursor to the fundamental shift in the artistic practice that would take shape less than a decade later with the onset of computational machines. One of the, no one can say with certainty who the first generative artist or algorithmic artist was, but starting in the early 1960s, there were two major centers of innovation, and the first being a uh, Bell Labs uh, in, in New Jersey in the United States. Uh, it was here where artists like A. Michael Knoll, Lillian Schwartz, Ken Knowlton, uh, and even Namjoon Pike would, would uh, enter their, their, would foray into the computer art practice that spanned across 2D, 3D, audio, and animation. There are many artists uh, that can be discussed today, but uh, for the sake of time, I will focus on A. Michael Knoll. So, a. Michael Knoll, uh, at the time uh, in Bell Laboratories, it was, it was a research facility for the, for the military, uh, but they began to look into the machine's ability to create art and music, and engineers initially orchestrated the making of these works. Uh, in the summer of 1962, Michael Knoll uh, pr produced a really famous memo uh, referred to as Patterns by 7090, uh, in which he explained the digital computer is presently being used to produce new musical sounds and techniques for composing. The, advent, the advent of microfilm film printing used in conjunction with a digital computer allows for excursions into the field of visual art. Thus, it would certainly be interesting to attempt the creation of novel designs by using the IBM 7090 computer and the Stromberg Carlson 420 microfilm printer. So for context, this is what the IBM 790 computer looked like. It was the size of a room and the printer was, you know, at the time, there were no graphical user interfaces. And so we had to, well, they had to use pen plotters, plotters to actually produce the visual artwork. Uh, this was really just the beginning for Noel, and he, would, he used uh, the programming language Fortran to, uh, to produce his works. So this set off an idea for him after creating his work, uh, what he, which he referred to as Guajin Quadratic, um, that it had a resemblance to uh, modernist abstraction. In this case, he saw it look like Majoli from uh, Pablo Picasso. And so this gave him the idea to experiment with creating or appropriating a famous modern artwork. Um, and he wanted to see an experiment, this human or machine uh, project in which he created a work that represented or, or essentially looked look like a, 
uh, modernist artwork and see what the people thought. It was his idea of the modern Turing test. So he decided he was going to digitize, uh, recreate a composition with lines by Mondrian. And by identifying the Cartesian coordinates for each lines and points, he turned Mondrian's painting into a program. Uh, but a perfect copy of the original did not interest him. He wanted to see if the computer could apply some of its own creative uh, agency. And so as a substitute for artistic intuition, Noel employed pseudo-random number generator, which varied the bar density, lengths, and widths of Mondrian's line. Uh, and he manipulated this program until he, he felt it was, it was close enough. And so later that year, he decided that he would take a test. And he, he went around and asked people whether they thought this Either of those were made by a computer, but he took it a step further and asked, which one do you like better? And the results showed that 59% of the subjects preferred the computer-generated image, and only 28% were able to identif identify correctly the pictures produced by Mondrian. Um, this has become a classic experiment uh, in, in aesthetics, and one first prize in the August 1965 contest held by Computers and Automation magazine. Next, we have the Stuttgart University in the 1960s. This is a parallel hub for the earliest pioneers in computer art. One of the professors, philosopher Max Benz, led a profound impact on the students, George Nies and Friedernake, and artists like Manfred Mohr on aesthetics. The adoption of the term generative art actually came from Max Benz. Uh, and at the time, you know, the term generative art and computer art were interchangeable, uh, but this didn't come out of nowhere. Early pioneers adopted, adopted this term generative from Max Benz and his highly influential writings on generative aesthetics. This idea, uh, he tried to create a rational aesthetic, uh, free from, some, from subjective speculation and grounded upon scientific base. So he looked at it kind of like this, uh, aesthetic measurement or uh, order, the ratio of order and complexity. And in Stugart, a generation of young scientists examined the different aspects of the mathematical value of information contained in aesthetic objects. Two of these artists were George Nice and Frieda Nake. They were highly inspired by the idea of generative aesthetics, and you can see in their artwork the play of order and disorder. The first exhibition, the first public generative art ex uh, expedition of computer art was at the University of Stuttgart, and it was called Generative Computer Graphic, and it showcased the work of George Nice. It was seen with a lot of disdain, and people were very angry, but uh, they, they kept going, and later on in that year, the, in the United States, there was an exhibition at Howard Wise Gallery in New York City where the works of uh, George Nice, Frieder Nake, and, Michael, and A. Michael Knoll were also showcased. Uh, four years later, George Nice wrote his uh, PhD dissertation uh, on, called Generative Computer Graphic, uh, under Benz applying his aesthetic uh, explicitly on computer art. And so this is really where that term generative came to play, which Max Benz actually took from uh, Noam Ch uh, Chomsky's studies on generative grammar, which was largely influential on the creation of computer programming languages. So at this moment, we're seeing a lot of mathematicians, scientists, and engineers playing around with visual art. But at the same time, we see artists find the computer. So what some of these artists are Vera Molnar, uh, which Benji covered in his, uh, in his discussion, uh, Manfred Mohr, and Harold Cohen. All of these artists studied, uh, studied art history in, in school. They were practice, uh, practicing painting or drawings. And uh, Harold Cohen specifically really was exploring uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and seeing if he could teach a robot to draw. I think he was very upset about the, <laughs> the program's use of color, because he felt it was a bit insulting, because he really liked the way that he used colors. Um, so then we see a few years later the landmark exhibition Cybernetic Serendipity, and this is the first instance where computer art is being taken seriously uh, in, a, in a national scale, uh, international scale. Um, and 
Artists like Charles Surrey, Frieda Nake, A. Michael Knoll, John Whitney, and others were there, including uh, Nam June Pike, James Seabright, John Cage, Kenneth Knowlton, and uh, a few others. And so this exhibition had three major components, computer-generated art, cybernetic devices, robots, painting machines, and machines demonstrating the use of computers and the history of cybernetics. Um, following this, I think we see a lot of the, the usage of the, of the computer in the visual art side anyway, is this idea of replacing the, the tools that we were using. So you can think about uh, paint or Photoshop where you're essentially just replacing what we would do with the pen and paper and making it digitally. Uh, but once we enter the 21st century, we can start to see a major change happening in, in the way that we were innovating with computer graphics. And the introduction of the internet was huge. So now we're starting to see uh, Flash come to play and the rise of sharing of information online. So the MIT Media Lab is a huge major influence on what, what we see generative art as today. So um, though she might not be a, a programmer, Muriel Cooper was highly influ influential in uh, the start of the MIT Media Lab. She uh, started the MIT's Visual Language Workshop, which then moved to the MIT Media Lab in 1985 as one of its founding sources. Um, John Maeda became a professor there, and it was there where he kind of created this new program referred to as Design by Numbers, and it was this idea of creating a platform for artists and designers to explore programming. It was rather junky to use, it wasn't very easy. And so he called in some of his students to help him. And so in the 90s, several brilliant technologists uh, began to work on this, uh, two of those being Ben Fry and Casey Reese. They decided to rebuild this and took it, went all over the place, tried to get feedback, and decided to make a much more accessible uh, <laughs> program, to say the least. And they called this platform uh, Processing. So this is a, one of the early forms of processing. Uh, it was its own application. And even the, the words that it would use were a, a little bit more accessible for artists. So this is referred to as a sketchbook. They are not programs, they are sketches. You can play them, you can tinker around and see them run. And in the beginning, this was done uh, with a Java-based uh, programming. It was based off Java. Um, in 2012, they created the Processing Foundation to expand their research and support the software development and added Dan Schiffman and Lauren McCarthy as members of the foundational board. These two are massive. Um, Dan, uh, Dan Schiffman is one of the reasons I, most generative artists that you speak to, algorithmic artists that you speak to today, talk about Dan Schiffman. The videos that they watch on YouTube are the best. They're free, he's a professor at NYU, and he, He's just a quirky, funny guy. <laughs> I love him. He's great to watch. And then to the right, we have uh, P5, which is the JavaScript-based uh, version of processing. And this was done and led by Lauren McCarthy. And so now you can run processing in the browser. JavaScript is the language of the computer, of the browsers. Everything that we do on the internet, JavaScript is, is happening behind the scenes. So this changed everything. Um, this, we have open source, um, accessibility, YouTube, it, it's going everywhere. And now we have the advent of social media. And so now we have these artists that are learning online, sharing online, we're finding communities. Um, this is actually a snapshot of uh, the Artix Code Instagram back in, I believe, 2016, uh, where we were just sharing artwork for the artists that that we liked and wanted to share. And this is really what it looked like. We were just talking online, a bunch of hobbyists, having a good time, and starting Slack channels and sharing with each other. And it really wasn't until the advent of, of blockchain that things really started to change. So the impact of Larval Labs cannot be diminished. Um, I know that they look silly, I know that they look crazy, but uh, Matt and John from Larval Labs were really just trying to experiment. They heard about this blockchain thing and they were like, what, what is this? What can we do with it? Um, and so they decided that they were gonna play around with it. Uh, they were like, let's, let's create a program, we're gonna create all these different punks, all of them unique, and we'll try to put them on the, on the blockchain. At that moment, 
NFTs as we know them did not exist. This project was, became one of the key inspirations in the development of the ERC-721 standard, which is what we refer to now as uh, NFTs. And this project was launched in June of 2017, and at the time, you know, they were just experimenting. The code is not stored on chain. These are these were images, um, and it was it was a massive moment. And so, at the time, this is a screenshot of an exhibition, um, I guess showcase, not exhibition, <laughs> that I had organized in 2019. And right across from me were the the CryptoPunks. Um, and so, at this moment, every single one of these artworks were you know, created with an algorithm, but there was really no way to connect that with collectors. So we had a book that had all the code in there. And so when, a, when someone appreciated or connected with the visual aesthetic of the work and they wanted to acquire it, we would have the code printed out for them, give that into their, in all their package. So they'd get their certificate of authenticity, they'd get the code printed out, and they'd get the, the, the artwork there. Um, it was actually here that a collector came up to me and said, I, I'd be interested in buying an NFT of one of these works. I said, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? Absolutely not. Um, you know, you go on OpenSea, one of the major marketplaces, and all you would see were these collectibles. You would see monsters, you would see, you know, weird dinosaurs and stuff like that. And I thought these were, these were fine artworks, but um, after some discussion, we decided, well, we might as well experiment with it. So this is an example of one of the first NFTs that uh, Dimitri Cherniak, one of the artists that I work with, produced. Um, and it was a really, it was an aha moment for me. I remember going up to the collector afterwards with, my, with the print that he didn't want, by the way. He said he only wanted the digital asset, and I could not wrap my head around it. And when I approached him, I asked, you know, what, why? And that was the first time I saw this idea of collectors really embracing digital digital galleries and, and a virtual space where they can walk around and, uh, and showcase their work to the greater internet. Um, I still brushed it off ever so slightly. I said, okay, he's a crypto nerd, that's fine. Um, we'll keep it moving. Uh, but then something happened in 2019, and autoglyphs by there we go, uh, Larva Labs, there they are again, uh, came out. And so this was monumental. Um, this idea of a self-contained artwork on the blockchain. So when we talk about tokens and these tokens that represent or point to an image, this is completely different. The code, the artwork itself is stored in the token. It is self-containing. If, if you have the token, you have the artwork, you can decide to run it in any way that you want. Um, and this, it, it just, it opened up so, so much. Um, so whereas punks were images, the autoglyphs are code and viewed and acquired as such. So when you think about um, Walter Benjamin and this idea of losing the aura of a work in mass production, this changes that, where as someone who appreciates generative art, now when I acquire that artwork, I get the essence of it. I get the soul, the performative act of it running in the browser, um, which really, um, Again, just, it, can't, it can't be understated how important that is. So then in 2021, uh, we see, well, in 2020, uh, art blocks came about. So this is where that squiggle comes back. And Snowfro, Eric Calderon, started that and as a big experiment. And as you know, Marshall Duchamp said in 1957, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator adds his contribution to the creative act. And art blocks is, a key prime example of that. So in this instance, you can see a visual artwork that you like, and if you decide to collect it, um, you go ahead, you go in, you press mint or purchase, and what's stored on uh, the back end of, of Artblocks is the algorithm itself. And so as a collector, I'm evoking that algorithm and saying, I wanna see what you can give me. <laughs> and you get your own personal artwork from there, and, but that artwork cannot exist without the contribution of the collector. So in, 20, in February of 2021, we see kind of one of the major hikes in art blocks and people paying attention. Um, it exploded and the community really just went absolutely wild. And 
it started to raise also some questions on curation and criticism and what does it mean to have this type of artwork where the system can produce a thousand artworks. There's a, an artist, Tyler Hobbs, came out with the term long-form generativism to explain what this is. And you know, playing around with this idea that there can't be too much variation because then there's too much noise. No variation is boring. And somewhere in that sweet spot is where a lot of generative art seems to be navigating. And the great thing about generative art is that you can leverage the system to add that noise using randomness, whereas it would be too long to do that manually. And this was done on the Ethereum blockchain. And you know, through this evolving ecosystem, there have obviously been concerns about some of the environmental impacts of that as uh, in its early stages before it switches over now to the proof of stake network. And so we see the rise of uh, FX hash on the Tezos blockchain. And it's here where you see a lot of uh, artists, or especially early on, refer to this as the green NFT. And a lot of the artists that we work with uh, you know, that, that are here today, Iskra, Marcelo, um, and William also have done their work on, on Tezos. So I think here we kind of stop at where we start to get into the everyday life of the artist. And so um, I'd like to hear from the artists themselves and we can ask a few questions and, and go from there. Thank you so much. Okay, so Marcelo, Iskra, William, and Monica, can you please join me up here? <laughs> testing, testing, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, amazing. So. Thank you guys for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Marcelo, uh, Soria Rodriguez, William Apan, Iska Vidrkova, and Monica Rizzoli. So each of these artists are at the top of their game in the digital art space. But as we saw in the presentation, a lot of the pioneers came from engineering and mathematics. Uh, but artists started to emerge as well. What were you guys doing before you started making generative artwork? Go ahead. <laughs> I was a painter, but I'm still one, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's on, it's on, yeah. Um, yeah, I started uh, working as a data visualizer, which is actually very similar to generative art, but constrained by data. So um, that's how I enter in this world of code. Uh, for my part, I was uh, a creative developer, so it's a mix of being a creative with technical skills. Uh, I worked for 10 years in the advertising industry, so to put my skills, uh, my creative skills um, at work. And at some point I was like, uh, maybe I could do this for me, and that's how I started to work for myself and produce at works. Well, I was, um, I am a frustrated architect, um, but uh, for whatever reason, I ended up being an engineer. But uh, somehow, I, my career kind of co was converging towards, let's say, more creative things, which I also did on the side. Uh, I worked for uh, a little bit over 12 years at a bank, and uh, I quit my job to try and start my own little thing, mixing strategy and art, uh, actually with Iskra here. And, uh, and at some point, we said, you know, screw that, let's just do art. Amazing. So, um, how has engaging with algorithms opened up your creative process? <laughs> uh, it's kind of obvious for me to say because uh, I was looking for a way to draw with interaction. Uh, because when you my my first my first artwork in generative art was a landscape. And I was interested in how uh, the landscape landscape change uh, from different per perspectives. So we cannot do that without hand-onness or interaction. 
And that's why I moved to algorithmics to be able to introduce those concepts in the drawing or Yeah, in my case, as I mentioned, I, I started my journey with data. Um, but then, like 10 years ago, there was a similar hype to this thing with data scientists and all this thing, which was complicated to explain to people. So that was amazing. But then at some point, I, I just realized that the algorithms themselves were um, what I was interested in. Like, um, I was working in a bank, so my work was so related to a huge amount of customers. So I began like reflecting a lot about how algorithms change the way we we connect with the rest of the people and our context. So let's say some philosophical questions arose when I was there, and I I, I just couldn't go further in a big corporation, so I just stopped. And now I explore with the most vague freedom that I can the algorithm. So um, yeah, they're yeah, the, the main thing I, I work with. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, for me, I think, I, because I've, I was a developer before, I always work with algorithm. Um, but the idea of generative art started with uh, how can I develop beautiful things with my algorithm skills and mathematical th skills? And at the same time, as a hobby, uh, I paint a lot. Well, I have a lot of artistic uh, hobbies. And I was trying to merge both uh, worlds. And that's how my practice became um, as generative art. It was mostly how can I merge both things and make it random? And then you could start to explore how mathematical things and algorithm are beautiful and how you can merge them with traditional mediums. So that's how I came I came to it. Yeah, I guess I guess my story is more or less similar to, to Williams. Um, with this engineering background, somehow I had the hunch that code could bring me somewhere. And, and I, I kind of brought the, this approach of, oh, I have to do things modular. Oh, I have to do things reusable. Oh, I have to do things that repeat themselves but change a little bit. Uh, uh, but somehow, uh, when I was a little kid, the, the, the little things that I was drawing, because I was never a very good drawer, uh, were always like repeatable patterns, uh, maybe because I couldn't do anything else. Uh, so I thought, oh, I can do this. So I'm going to do this many times. Um, but then. Uh, somehow it, it was also present in music. I, I have always had like a very strong connection to music, and I, st I studied music before I did uh, generative art and other things. And uh, through the works of Johann Sebastian Bach, which is like mathematics and patterns, and, and brought to the maximum possible uh, uh, you know heights uh, for me. And uh, then the minimalist composers, which actually were doing things uh, in the 50s and 60s, connected to generative artists mm -hmm. back then. Uh, somehow that was also like a repeatable pattern that it, it kind of got stuck in my head. So it kind of was natural to try and pursue those interests through, through at some point, code and uh, those skills and try to produce something else. Are there any visual artists that specifically inspire you in, 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 in your practice? And that's a trick question because I know that you do. <laughs> Not a trick, an easy question. Your your last project, um, Entre Tiempos, if you wanted to talk about that. I had a photo of it up before. I don't know if you guys saw it, but um, yeah, please please talk about it. Well, okay. Um, uh, yeah, well, actually, that project was uh, based entirely in a desire to recreate the works of uh, Sonia de Launay and, uh, well, the Orphists. And, uh, and basically, in the end, as, as the project evolved, uh, it started uh, giving outputs that kind of resembled all the artists uh, from, from more or less the same period. I have seen some František Kupka actually coming out of the algorithm, which I didn't expect. Um, but it was, it was just out of a uh, need to recreate the emotions that I got from those works, which is kind of at the root of, of also my, my desire to do uh, generative art, which is I enjoy certain artworks very much, and they speak to me, and they move me very deeply. Uh, also music, but I'm a pretty lousy musician. Uh, so I had to do with what I have, which is code. Um, and just trying to recreate that. And to me, like it was like the perfect um, start uh, point. 
I'm going to try to recreate this somehow and see if I can then, through generative art, like you have shown us in your, in your beautiful introduction, thank you, uh, how can we bring this uh, through certain randomness and certain rules, how can we expand the total range of things that we can do within one uh, specific aesthetic? I think when we see the, the early pioneers out there, and they're, they're very much focused on the m most primitive forms, uh, squares, circles, and breaking them into every point that they can, um, we're seeing with this new wave of generative artists the focus on, on nature and uh, a bit more of a, a, a natural feel to their work. And I think two prime examples of this can be found in both William's work and Monica's work. Um, William, you are amazing with your use of texture, your creation of texture with your work, and Monica, your, your flowers are absolutely stunning. Um, I wanted to ask both of you if you can just kind of reflect on how you got there um, and, and what you were trying to explore. Um, I think I'm kind of an obsessive, obsessive person. Uh, uh, because when I like to do something, I can spend nights, you know, without sleeping. And and mostly my practice of art, uh, I wanted to to do it with my generative code. And it's mostly my observation, my deep, my long, 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 long observation of uh, paper, textile, uh, colors, and stuff like that. That. At some point, they just uh, got through my algorithm, and I think it's not. I'm not even trying to replicate what I was seeing all those you know, nights. It's more about it became part of me to produce texture, and because it's so deep in me, I just it just in my, my brain I just try to replicate it, and I'm not sure it's on purpose. It's just the way I work, and uh, and yeah. Yeah. So I love nature, it's obviously, and uh, uh, many, many years ago I asked myself, uh, is it possible to describe image through numbers? And uh, I didn't know about programming at, the time, at, at that time. And then I understood that nature is a kind of gen generative process. Uh, you can describe nature to numbers and equations, and you can extract beauty uh, from this. So I start to look at uh, the flowers and the animals, and not only about their statical appeal, but trying to understand how they grow, uh, what are the morphological aspects of those uh, uh, plants, how they change in different environments. That's why I have four uh, seasons in the work, because uh, you know, all of them has flowers, but actually I'm not trying to mimetize the nature itself. Uh, it's uh, a bit different because the most part of time you are using actual algorithms that were developed in universities to describe uh, fluids or you know botanic morphology, digital morphology, and things like that. But uh, if you are just using them as they are, uh, you are truly reproducing nature, but not always the visual aspect of the work is nice. You don't have this chaos order uh, in between uh, result. So, oh yeah, I think that's it. And this idea that you are always walking in a field and it's always changing depending on the seasons and, well. Yeah, definitely I agree with uh, Monica. It's, like, it's more about uh, how you interpret uh, what you see mm -hmm. and, and how you can inject it in your, in your own work. So it's not about mimicking or recreating something. It's more about questioning yourself um, how this is doing this in this context. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could ask the same question in my context and how it can apply to me. And Iskra, your work also has this this grain to it that I think is like so phenomenal. And you also play around and produce work with plotters. Um, how do you see I guess, the, the relationship between the two? And do you have a different process, whether you're working in a digitally native space or with the plotter? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
because most of my work is like based of many many thin lines, and when whenever I try to put them on the plotter, I just break everything. So um, yeah, you you have to design in a different way when you are meant to to plot that work, because there is something very powerful with generative art, which is. Uh, of course, there is randomness, there is a chance, there is a lot of things there, but also there is something for me which is, it's unachievable by a human. And that's uh, something very powerful and kind of related to what William said before uh, about finding things, not replicating, but just finding some new things and then applying to ourselves. So I think it's so powerful. And, and that's infinite, let's say. Uh, 1,000 iterations or 1 million or we can do whatever we want. But then when it comes to the physical world, uh, there is a huge constraint, a very simple one. My paper would break if I am depending on if it's summer or winter, if it's raining or not, uh, the humidity will affect the paper, the ink, everything. So, yeah, it's like it's a very artisan work at the end. So uh, that combination is a very interesting dialogue between us and the machine because we are uh, behind the machine when we plot. And maybe in the digital world, uh, it's on the reverse. So it's a very interesting process. In contrast with the traditional art space in which you know, when you go to a museum, one of the first things you do is take a look at the lines and, and the brush stroke of, of an artwork. Um, in this case, generative art is not so much of a tactical process, but more of, of a mental one, of, of, of the art of the mind. Um, what is your you know, what are your brush strokes? Do you see it as the, the functions that you create that you tend to reuse? Is it, how, how do you think about that, your distinct process of, of creation? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. The truth is, um, no, probably, I guess it's, it's probably different uh, to, to each, each of us. Mm -hmm. So, but in my case, it's, um, like I said earlier, my, my brush stroke is, it, it is the art of the mind, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, so it is in whichever original intention I had uh, to do this artwork. So, um, well, in the case of uh, this, this one shown yeah. up there, it was, like I mentioned before, I needed to create something like that because it was giving me a lot, so I tried to create something else. But when I have created other artworks, maybe it comes out of, for example, the inspiration of, I don't know, a ray of light that uh, reflects somehow in some space, uh, some different planes, and then I, I may spend uh, some minutes looking at that. And that thought is maybe my brush, mm. because then I will try to recreate this thought, and I'll, I'll say, this gave me some kind of emotion, how can I bring this uh, to life through code? Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, maybe it is actually a, a cyclical process, a feedback loop between this original idea and then the things that you're getting from the algorithm. And uh, as you move the work along, the brushes become the thoughts that come out of the algorithm itself. Because you see, your, you see what comes out of it and you say, oh, um, this makes me think about whatever thing. And then that thought, which maybe has nothing to do with the artwork, comes back in the, in the way of, oh, I have this idea, or I have this reflection on, on what the artwork is actually telling me, that I will couple with the artwork itself. In my case, I, I try to produce sometimes small articles writing about the thoughts that mm -hmm. come with the artwork. And, and they are the same thing. I mean, what is the artwork? The visuals uh, that, oh, that the algorithm is That was my next question. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, if you guys can comment on that. Uh, I think my broad stroke is pretty much than, like the same than Marcelo. I think it's more about um, a process. I think the, yeah, the process is the broad stroke, if I think about it, and how we can iterate. I think iteration is a big part of the process in general art. And, and I think the broad stroke, your function, your code, just affine the more you work on it. Mm -hmm. And I, at, the, at the very beginning, it's a big splash of thought. And the more you work on it, the more it becomes narrow. And I think, yeah, that's that, that process that's defining the work, basically. Yeah, yeah for me, it's, it's again the code. Because actually, when I plot 
my brush is my brush <laughs> because I, I use brush. Um, so, but you know, in a very simple way, my brush and the computer are the pixels, maybe, and then if I print the work, are ink on paper. But then, more than the brush, for me, is like in painting, uh, you have techniques, you have um, years of learning to draw properly things, and th and that's what we're doing with code. Because for me, like maybe the huge difference between generative, not not digital, but generative, is that we have to manage, we have to control the out of control, you know, because with the brush, you, you have the brush and Pollock, you know, he painted like out of control, but he was constrained to, to ink or something. And and now it's like you, you guide the system with a few rules and then you have to balance an infinite uh, range of outputs, but you have to be able to guide those randomness. So um, I don't know if that that was the question, but but yeah, I just uh, got here because for me, it's like yeah, it's 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 about the code, it's about the process, and yeah, I, I guess the same is for you guys. You mean the brush as what is specific from me in yeah. the work? Yes. So I think is the color contrast, and also I used to work with several events. Uh, at the same time in the plane. Um, well, I don't know if it's clear for uh, everybody this, but when I, uh, an event is something that uh, begins a process in the algorithm that will uh, result in an image on the paper. So I have several things you know, at the same time. Uh, I also like to um, use the same color at the background and at the figures, so sometimes you can blur those limits, it's not so clear. And also, uh, usually I work with, uh, uh, what we can say, uh, codes of nature, or codes related to botanics or fluid dynamics, or. Uh, Morphology in general. So he already references, but I do have to ask: What do you believe is the art? Um, is it the code? Is it the output? Is it your? Is it your thoughts? Where? What? Is it the system and all of the all of the outputs as one? Um, how do you feel about that? There's, you know, it's kind of an open-ended question in a way. So. Um, just your thoughts on that. It's all together. Yeah. They cannot exist one without another, so... You mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's the art in this? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not an art expert, mm -hmm. but what I, what I know about the art history, you know, there are different movements and the concept is something, the technique is something. I feel here um, the beauty is very important. Uh, it's something that you can be a great engineer, but, but then you have to put some soul in the process and, and some aesthetic feeling. But I found, uh, in my case, when, what I really look for in my work, and, and because I, I'm trying to find where the art is, um, the art is in the process, it's the thing that I began uh, in the first question, and it's about um, connections, and for me, machines can, let's say, I, I truly believe in this, um, make us more human. Because we have um, like a big questions from the beginning of the times about who we are, uh, why we're here, so on. So now machines have the ability to process a lot of information, a lot of different contexts, they can relate this information. So I'm sure they can answer some of those questions. And if you are very attached to science or uh, formal, let's say, knowledge, you can sometimes not advance so fast because what you are saying is not true because it's not a formal thing. But if you go through art, you can just get crazy there. And, you know, as a kid, maybe at some point you can discover something. So that's the art for me of all this thing, uh, getting to these questions through um, a beauty or that's for me, I think. Thank you. 
what is her said. <laughs> um, and I would add, uh, generative art is like the the art is the collaboration mm -hmm. between us, the artist, the, the the input, and what the machine can do. Uh, I often in my work uh, push the limits of the, of the machine. At some point, they literally cry. You know, yeah, I can't do what you're asking for. You know, <laughs> so we have to. I have to deal with those limits and those constraints, uh, especially with the blockchain because it's really restrictive. And I think the beauty is uh, both in the output and both in the process. It's, I think to understand, to fully appreciate generative art, you have to, un to, to understand both aspects. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm happy that you asked that question. <laughs> No. Um, uh, well, the thing is, it, uh, maybe maybe it is two different things. What is the art in generative art, which which I don't know very much. What is the artwork for me? Mm -hmm. uh, but but there's there's really two different things. What is the art in what I do, and what is the artwork that I'm trying to do at one given moment? Mm -hmm. So um, regarding what is the art to me, the art is probably what I, a little bit what I was mentioning earlier. What I do it because I want to, to provoke an emotion, uh, just some kind of reaction in, in, in whoever is experimenting the art work. So um, maybe it's, yeah, like I said, maybe it's, a, maybe it's an emotion, maybe it, is, maybe it is rejection, maybe it's just a thought, oh, uh, this is curious, and maybe, maybe it evokes you something. So finding a relationship between the artwork and the experience Experiencer of the artwork, uh, to me that is kind of where the, the art lies. But the artwork itself, what is the artwork in the case of generative art? Is it the code? Is it the output? Is it one output or is it the thousand outputs? Is it the way you react to the fact that there are a thousand outputs that are uh, interesting or not? So it is a lot of things and that's why I was uh, mentioning earlier that to me it's um, it's, it's like a moving target between a lot of things where also uh, the artist's process comes into play. And that's uh, why for me, for example, it's, it's interesting to put out uh, some, some writing, some article, mm -hmm. trying to express the ideas uh, that came with the artwork along. And, and in this sense, it, it reminds me a lot of this John Cage piece. 340 something, 350 something, I never remember the exact numbers, but it's like silence for three minutes and 40 whatever seconds. And, and it's, 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 I think it's, I have never seen it performed live, but I want to, because it, I, to me it is so mesmerizing just to see some people coming out in, on stage with, the, you know, they will tune their instruments and they will do like they're going to play and then they stay silent for three and something minutes and then they wait, they stand up and they get an ovation. I mean, they have an ovation or maybe someone throw something because they didn't. But, but, but that, that, that it's that, that relationship, right? So, so what is the art or the artwork there? I've got no idea. That's my answer. And so how did you guys, so as you've experimented with creating these visual works of art, how did you find yourself experimenting with NFTs and, um, you know, start, starting to put your work out there? How did that start? Anyone? Go for it. <laughs> Actually, it's wonderful because uh, before NFTs, uh, we needed to plot something or to, you know, try to find some kind of projection or to program a hasbear to connect it to something. And it's like, it, it was always a kind of, uh, we call it in Portuguese, a gambiarra, a kind of mishmash, I think. And now with NFTs, uh, when you are with the code inside the contract, it's perfect. Uh, it's a perfect way to, uh, you know, uh, I, I can even say it's so perfect. <laughs> it's, kind of like, uh, it's finally, it has your own place to exist. Mm. I think uh, there place for different things. NFTs are one thing, are one channel, but um, as you mentioned before, plot, we, before we had to plot, and I think, yeah, now you can still plot. plot. Yes, yeah, of yeah, course, I, mean, I, I love mean, plot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or <laughs> don't say you cannot. No. Um, you can plot, you can uh, exhibit things, so there are just different ways to do 
The thing is that for many years we've been restricted to creating things which we were completely uh, aware that they had no value because it was a digital asset. So, or I did a visualization when I was working in that. So, for me, it was kind of an, an art because it, it, it could take me like one year on finishing one visualization, a good one. I don't work like so fast, let's say. But I mean, um, now you can add value to these things. So, when my work is digital, I just go through NFTs because it's like the way to put it on the market and get value to the code itself. When we talk to generative, not uh, again digital versus generative, there is, a, for me, a, a, a difference there. So, yeah, uh, there are now things that I can understand the um, discussion many times of, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not, I don't agree with that, but it's something that we can discuss. If we can put everything on the NFT uh, sphere, like, for instance, I, I, I do plot work, plotter work, and then I can also sell it through NFTs, which is fine. Uh, I, I, but I'm not sure if this is the way, because we invented this because we, we had the need. So if we miss, mess everything, that will be uh, the perfect uh, recipe for um, discussions. But I mean, if we really understand why the NFTs are here, and, and they're just because we need to get value to the things, and when we don't need them, we don't use them. So, I think the question is, uh, are we using NFT as a contract or as a medium? Because mm -hmm. it can be both, but the choice that you make when you are you know, meeting your, your artwork it makes all the difference. It's a medium or it's just the contract? Um, personally, I think that NFT, a good thing with the NFT that they, um, they opened up the generative art bottle. You know, it's like, oh, there's this bottle, we forgot it uh, at the back. And uh, I think that's the best thing that happened to a generative art ever. But that's not the, the end of it. We don't need to, you know, to, to fix our thoughts on it. And to, it. Currently, I think, the the vibe is more like uh, can we convert physical and traditional uh, artwork into making something NFT or look like look alike uh, traditional art? But I think that there's much more to it. Like I think the animation NFT is really under underrated. Um, what about an NFT that can change uh, depending on the season? Uh, there's so much more to explore, and I think we're just at the beginning. But because we have the background from the traditional work, uh, world. But um, I think experimentation is on the way, but it's just really the beginning. It's really, and we don't need to, I th the good thing is now we see Jennifer Art as art. Um, and now we can turn, go back to the old and traditional world and say, hey, this is art. And we can value it and we can see it and we can you know, we can say that's proper art. So that's a, that's a good um, ping pong feedback, I would say. But that's not, that's not the end of it. I think there's much more. Yeah, not much, not, not much more to add, but um, just to stress one thing, uh, it is undeniable that the fact that NFTs are there uh, makes this, um, uh, well, uh, there, there's money in it, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, but this this has been actually good because of what William was saying. Um, all of a sudden, if there is money in this, then people will actually look at it. Because otherwise, you wouldn't look at something that, you know, right -click, click, save, etc. Um, and actually, um, there are uh, all this debate about, oh, is, is it, uh, this is all just pure speculation. And, well, you know, artists also have to eat and they also mm -hmm. have to get paid. And if you were a digital artist that, that were producing in a digital, originally digital, because you were doing it with code, mm -hmm. um, you, you didn't really have many other options. And, and, and okay, so the field has been now blooming uh, in, the, in the past year mm -hmm. because actually there were, act, there were many practitioners uh, and many people who were interested, but they, were not, they couldn't really dedicate the time to it. So I think um, we, we, we uh, I mean, I, I totally subscribe what they said, and, and I think there is a lot of exploration uh, yet to come. Uh, and we always need to understand that NFTs use 
for two purposes, which is also, I guess, what uh, Monica was saying. Uh, they can be act just as a contract, just this financial side, which we need. Uh, and then there is this uh, NFT as an exploration medium, which, which has so much potential. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think um, just for, uh, for time, I guess we'll just kind of wrap it up, but I do just want to stress uh, digital art as a whole tends to be uh, wrapped up or used. The words are typically digital art, computer art, generative art, all these things, and there is a stress, uh, especially for, for me as a, as a curator, um, to really define or start defining the taxonomy to describe this artwork um, and looking into algorithmic art, but what is algorithmic art on the blockchain and um, really starting to strengthen up the criticism and uh, this, the, the, the thought leadership behind it. So um, I, we're, we're pretty much, I think, at time. I'm hoping we can get some, some questions from the audience. Uh, I think that would be really helpful. So if anybody has any questions, please uh, raise your hand, let us know. Cool. Hi. Uh, so my question is, um, because in uh, this type of art, there's always an element of randomness associated with it, more in others than uh, uh, others. So my question is, uh, when you find that unpredictability, how much uh, do you lend yourselves to it? And how much does it influence your work? So it's kind of like, do you, uh, do you, how much do you force your own vision into the work that comes out as an output? So how much do you lend yourselves to it? Thank you. That's uh, for all four of you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I can start. Um, I would say there's like, there's two ways of working in art. You know, there's this long form that we, we saw uh, last year blooming, and but there's still the old way to do it. And I think in the old way to do it, the random, randomness has a huge part. Uh, you just let the computer output something and you just work with it. And with the long form, it's a bit different. It's You start from something really random, and you you try to to compose with what your computer is giving to you, and try to limit to limit it, you know, to constrain it in, into like a box, to to say, okay, don't go outside of this box, because I know this is, this is the sweet the sweet spot of my algorithm, and this is where you should go. But I think this is really really constraining a lot the algorithm and there is so much more outside of the box. And I think this is very I think it's really important to let like a full randomness uh, guide you as well. So it's really collabor again a collabor collabor collaboration. You know, just throw something like a random z zero, one, two, three and just see what happens and then you can work from it. Yeah, in my case I'm not a coder. So I, I don't have this discipline, which I enjoy a lot. Because in my case, I, I, let's say I can read code, I can write code, but it's not like I, was, I studied that. So from my process, what I try to do always is start from something that I, I write, or I have a, an, some algorithm from nature, as you mentioned before, from um, physics or whatever, and then I destroy it completely. And there is something very beautiful in that because if you destroy it and you put like very crazy parameters and, and really destroy it, then sometimes uh, you see appearing some natural figures and that's amazing because you didn't design that, but sometimes I obtain like birds or flowers or the sea or skylines. And then when I see something, I say, okay, here there is something very interesting. And, and, and then you, you begin polishing the process until getting to, to where you think you can go. But that process, it's, it's, it's incredible because if you really find a, a leaf in your program and you weren't uh, trying to do that, that unlocks these kind of questions that I was telling in the, in the beginning. Uh, 
maybe we can start understanding why the leaves are like that. Because if I go back in my code and I say, wow, this is so crazy what I did here. And then you say, OK, so the leaves are done by that uh, with these rules. So yeah, there is a, as you mentioned before, a forth and back all the time about randomness um, and, and polish that randomness. Yeah, I, I think there is um, a good, um, I would say, a good uh, paradigm in generative art is the concept of uh, emergence. And the, most of the time, you, you have an idea and you end up completely uh, somewhere else. Because you find on the way something. You rarely go from point A to point B. It's really, you, you end up uh, something, you know, yeah, Z. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I just like to play with code, and so it's, it's. <laughs> yeah, so playing with code is very important, indeed. And uh, just just to add a little bit to what they say, uh, yeah, sometimes sometimes you have like a very clear idea. I want to make this system like so this one that we showed here. To me, it was like very clear. I wanted to get there. Uh, so of course there is the, the you open the door to say let's all these parameters throw all the random numbers you can at them to see where uh, where you get at, to see this emergence, to see what, what happens when you break it, like Iskra was saying. But th let's say it already had a very strong focus to something, like I'm painting rings there, so it, it, you know, you kind of go very far away from there. Um, um, but then there's also another source of randomness, which is all the bugs that you make in your code uh, that open up new doors. And uh, and my works are full of bugs uh, undercover. Uh, that that is like, oh, look at this beautiful shape there. That's a bug, but I liked it. And and it's it's not so strange. I believe this happens in absolutely everything we do. I mean, like we have discovered medicines thanks to that, and other things. So so it's just another way of incorporating randomness into into what you do. Just wanted to add that. Just. To add something related to that, now there is a very interesting debate in the community when we release long form projects, that's that then you have like 1,000, and then, I don't know, uh, in the middle of the minting, you discover that there is a bug which uh, makes your, pro your program like not working properly, and that's like so stressing. But, but then there is a question there, can an artwork be wrong. <laughs> Can, uh, my artwork doesn't work now. <laughs> what does it mean? So this is very interesting because we are in the middle of uh, a design system or uh, an engineer, uh, engineering uh, engine and an artwork which I think it, it cannot not work, you know? So yeah, it's, it's an interesting point now. Yeah, I think this is where we have to be careful with the market and how it drives us into making something. And we have to be, you no, know, you have to be, how to say, like, um, you have to own our, our work and say, yeah, this is what it is. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But this is what I have to offer. I have a mean question. That might be okay. a, a modernist question um, related to medium specific specificity. And uh, I'm asking you because you're in front of me, uh, but I could ask to people uh, or to anybody. What I've seen, uh, like that uh, you have shown, in many ways doesn't differ so much from works of art that could be produced by other means. You have a work and you acknowledge that, that looks like, um, or like is inspired by Sonia Delaunay. Uh, land, uh, uh, flower pattern that I could remind, that could remind me of uh, the movement pattern and decoration um, and so on and so forth. You are working with a medium, with technology, which is extremely uh, um, innovative. And you were mentioning artists like Namjoon Pike, 
John Cage. When I look at the work of Nam Jun Pike, when I listen to the three minute and so on of silence, something about with Pike, sculpture, moving image, communication, music changed or understanding of what a work of art can be. If I look, if I listen to John Cage, the result of what he does, whether it's with music or when he does, when he worked with, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to figure, remember the name of uh, his musical partners, uh, but something about our understanding of music changes. When I see what I've seen coming out of NFTs. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but I've, I, 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 it's really a genuine question. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I am. Uh, what is a medium specificity? How what you produce might or might not, it might not be the point, affect, change the way we think of art and the way Art can, um, yeah, the way we think of art. Um, as an art historian, you know, I, uh, I always, that's what I look at. I'm searching for that. Something, I want to see something that I want to see because I have never seen it before. So how the medium that you use is pushing us to look at something that we have never seen it before or maybe to look at something in ways we have never looked at something before. Thank you. I can try. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I, whether I will. Uh, I like to think about generative art as a natural uh, continuation of the conceptual art and the concrete movement. Uh, in, uh, in an essence, you are working with uh, uh, geometric forms because you need to describe them in, in, in a numerical way so the program can work. That's more or less uh, the concrete movement that mm -hmm. can. And from the conceptual, I like to think about Saul Lewitt and the wall drawings. So he has an instruction, but it's an analogical one. It's a generative process. You can call it this. And what's different when you are talking about a digital uh, generative process? Well, you have the computer. You have uh, the ability to produce a lot of outputs from one information. And I think uh, that changes everything because when you think in a work, you are not thinking about one image. You are thinking in a system that you have no total control. You don't know how the images will look like, and you will generate like 3,000 images. And you need to trust your system because uh, uh, in, it's similar in visual ways to the conceptual or to the concretes, uh, but uh, what you are uh, doing there, it's completely different. I don't know if I made myself clear in a way. Uh, so if the, 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 the notion that from one decision, mm -hmm. you can produce these uh, uh, 3,000, 3, 3 million images, how in the, how do you share that? Because that's for me a very important, in what you say, it's yeah. very important. This uh, endless uh, yes. uh, um, generation. So how, when you show your work, when you share your work, this notion of this uh, uh, inflation of uh, content, whether it's sound or images, how do you share that? And how this inflation of content can actually, or can it, be transparent enough that we understand the way it has been conceived. Oh, can, can I keep yeah. going? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like... Uh, Thank you for indulging. <laughs> well, it, it's my pleasure, actually. Uh, with some friends, we always talk about it, and uh, I think it, there is a few ways to, to see these questions. Uh, one of those is uh, when you 
when you don't trust your system a lot, so you produce like 1,000 images and you make, uh, we call it in Portuguese, curatoria da aleatoriedade, like you create your own aleatoriedade. I understood that, of course. Yes. And then you choose like four, three images, and that's what you are going to show. And that's a way to understand. So you pick three, four good images, and you narrow that to, to those results. Or you can know, uh, pass through a process like art blocks. When you have no idea what's going to happen, you need to trust, you have a system, and then you have 10,000, and not three. And uh, so I think uh, when you look at a group of images, you can make a few questions. Uh, are they uh, semelant enough to be part of this, the same group? And are they different enough to uh, continue giving me interest to see another one and another one and another one? I think those questions are good guides to us to try to understand. It's like another uh, comparison that we can do. It's uh, Albers and the, the squares. I don't know in English the name, <laughs> but the square everybody knows. So uh, he did so many of them. And it's easy to do this in a computer. You could do it to be very simple. And uh, But the repetition and the, try, the understand that he was trying to do as the, you see the whole group of paintings. I think you, you can try the same perspective in generative art as when you are going to see Albers, for instance. Yeah, um, I was going to add, I think it's more about, um, it brings us back to the brings brings us back to the question from uh, Sofia, like what's what's the art, and I was saying it's more about the context that you have to grasp, and also you have to understand that this is not only about the outputs, it's also the systems, and this is a combination that makes the art, and and as uh, Monica was saying, when you see one output, it's part of a system, and I think you have to zoom out and see the whole thing to appreciate the system. For me, I really thank you for a question because I think it's the most interesting question um, anybody asks me or um, in, in something like that because I, I agree. Um, I think we are in the very beginning of um, something that takes all the work from the pioneers, but now we have just bigger computers and more powerful to do things, but we take from there all the knowledge and all the, you know, they were braver than us uh, bringing this to a table in like 50 years ago. So now we are taking this with great computers, with um, machine learning knowledge, with some AI knowledge, but you know, the people who really know how to do that, they come from the engineering uh, fields or so, most of us, we deal with these um, questions and complexity, and I'm sure uh, we are not, we, we have not exploded yet, because it's, yeah, we, we don't, we are like, we have to be aware of the market. We have to understand the financial question. We have to understand the technology. We have to understand blockchain and everything. And I miss provocation in the work. And that's something that we, we talk a lot about. And I'm sure with the provocation will come something that you can say, aha, at some point with someone who, I don't know, in, in the near future, uh, once everything is like established, one can break it. Now it's like we have to deal with many, many things, and, and I miss that, this provocation. But maybe it, it could start with reflecting, as Sophia does um, very well, about how to exhibit the work. And yeah, you mentioned you have to see the whole system. Yeah. So a good provocation in terms of thinking about that question is in terms of a museum for example, the museum has the works it has, and it's complicated to change that works, like um, 
every day, right? Because um, you don't have a lot of work. So if you can find a, a generative artist with, who built like a very consistent system and, and a good one, maybe he or she can fill the whole building in, if you have the means, like a, a great printer and everything, like in one, one hour. So that is something that... That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can change it. Uh, Do I still need people? Hmm? Do I still need people? Or just have a machine. <laughs> <and a printer? laughs> yeah. But I mean, that's some change in, in the thing that one artist can fill a whole building in one hour with something that actually is beautiful and works and it's consistent and so that's the work or just one iteration. So I, I believe that the way we exhibit the work uh, changed like during the last centuries. So once we decided to exhibit the work with space around, it has a meaning uh, because we had to see that work like what it is, and then the other one far from it because it's another thing. But now, if everything is sound of the same system or daughter, we don't need this space, or maybe we do, I don't know. But this reflection about, uh, in my head, looks like this. Uh, crazy houses of psychopaths with a lot of pictures connecting That's things. That's the definition of a museum. <laughs> That's the definition of a museum, the big houses of psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's a great place to, to do that. Yeah, so, um, uh, well, uh, I, I subscribe everything that has been said, and I think also uh, it goes very much to the question of what is the work of art here. And, and uh, to this point, the NFTs have been both a blessing and a curse, because blessing because it has allowed uh, people to, you know, enter the space and devote themselves to do art, but a curse because of uh, Bipel. Uh, well, well, not, I mean, not, not, not poor him, but, um, but the thing is, it, it now everything stinks like oh you're just trying to make money and 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 we ha we haven't had the time really to still develop what has uh, what, all the things that we've been doing like they have uh, very uh, very well described um, there are very interesting projects that are um, maybe like the silence of John Cage or like the white canvas of uh, Malevich the, wh or the white uh, square of Malevich which is it's just a white square well, what are you doing well, it has some significance, and, and uh, well, yeah, I see you there. I see you. Um, uh, well, for some, but uh, but there are uh, like artworks that um, I mean, you have seen like here just still images of, of these things. Um, well, some of the artworks, for example, and allow you as digital art, they allow you to encode things other than the end end picture. Because what is the end picture um, in some artworks? For example, you can expose the whole painting process, which you cannot do with traditional art, and maybe it's interesting because maybe it's a middle point, the artwork, or maybe the artwork is the whole process, or maybe the artwork is something else. And, and you, you actually get to see those things in certain projects, and then there are other projects where you actually breed artworks combining this artwork and this artwork, and they will mix together, and there will be another artwork born in the blockchain. Uh, and then the, the two parents are going are going to disappear, uh, which is which is also an interesting artwork in itself, uh, and it's generative, and it's uh, so so it's it the, the problem again is it, it's very hard to show those artworks mm -hmm. uh, with one image. They require a whole new way of thinking about uh, first what is the artwork and then how you uh, show it, like uh, we've been discussing. And I, I do believe that your question is one that would get us started, like for hours yeah. uh, talking. And and I, I believe that we all would love to continue this conversation. So if at any point you would like to keep it, um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I actually have a comment too <laughs> because I think um, thinking about you know how do you display this artwork? What is the artwork? And we look at, again at a solo a perfect example where he gives the museum a set of instructions to to execute the artwork but uh, Frida Nake put it best saying this is a post-industrial art so now we don't need a craftsman to create the artwork uh, the machine does it for us so the artists here are, are giving their ideas they're making it very explicit for the computer to, uh, to to produce that and I think when we think about 
uh, how to showcase it and, and bring it into our physical space. There are a lot of different ways to do that, and I think that's also the most interesting part, where now it's not a one-size-fits-all answer of how you decide to showcase your, your generative art, because it might look really beautiful as a print, even though it lives, uh, you know, it, it lives on the computer, or maybe it's going to be done with a, a projector or what or a digital screen. I think now there's all this rise of, of people trying to fight for digital screens to have in their home. Um, but I th that's we're at this exciting point now where we get to we're trying to figure out how is the best way to showcase generative artwork outside the computer. Because I think right now in the computer we do you know the grid. The grid is everywhere. We just see all this artwork living in this grid, and we scroll down, and it's how collectors look trying to see which one has this feature that I'm looking for. Um, but trying to translate that into a physical space, I think, is, is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, so if, if I can add just something yeah. very short. Actually, the grid is also a curse, mm -hmm. and it's because of the market. Yeah. And it's because we want to buy one iteration of the algorithm without understanding that the artwork maybe is the whole thing, is mm -hmm. the algorithm, which is, by the way, good, because then, then we can eat and, and do more art. Uh, well, I don't know if that's good, that we can make more art. In some cases, maybe that's not so good. <laughs> but uh, but the thing is, uh, no, but the thing is that um, um, it's, it's very hard to understand when you see the grid, uh, what is the, the, the algorithm. So sometimes, uh, no, it's not very typical, but you also get to see uh, that the work sold is the generator itself, which is more interesting, mm -hmm. because that is the algorithm expressing itself in real time, and you get the point that whenever that image goes away and the next one comes along, the previous one is gone forever. Uh, because we, we are kind of too used to hold on to uh, permanent objects, maybe because we are afraid to die. Mm. And, and we say, oh, if I have this painting, which is always the same, then I'm also going to be always the same. That painting is going to be there when you die, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so maybe if you have an artwork that also dies constantly, which is what generative art inherently is, mm. because we decide to keep outputs. Uh, but we, we That's actually we a don't great idea that if you own art, the art you own dies when you die. That sorry, sorry? If, if you, that, that's a fantastic idea, that as a collector, you, own, you have a collection, and the moment you die, the collection self-destroys. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> or you give it to a museum. With, 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 with an NFT, you can do that. With digital art, you can do that. Yeah. 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 It's very easy. <laughs> Would you would you ever sell a collector your algorithm or I, that's something I've always like thought about you know yes, would it, yes? okay <laughs> like, would you sell the algorithm know. as art and, like you know the just the algorithm just the algorithm you 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 give them the code dun dun depends yeah. <laughs> dun dun, I, I don't yeah. know how <laughs> is it going to be cop left or <laughs> it depends on just the terms to think about <laughs> the, if, Make good, not war. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I just put one more aspect of the, the generative art that I think that is not uh, so related to the aesthetics, but that I think it also uh, shapes what this medium is. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a kind of encoding of information. So it imagery relates to a very precise input. So I can use as input everything I would like to. Uh, for instance, I could use the uh, age of you, the name, or your ID number, and this will be encoded in a visual way. Uh, you are not perceiving that, but all of those works are related to one very specific input. And also, uh, it's something that we are not seeing right now here, but uh, it's this idea that uh, algorithms can be evolutionary. And you can have images that die, that mm -hmm. you know, uh, cross with each other in collections that, that die. There's there's one artist, Def Beef, who does that anytime he's created this entire series of, of uh, algorithmic artwork that anytime it's transferred to a new collector, it slowly disintegrates, uh, which is fascinating. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Are we? How are we with time? I think we still have a couple of minutes. Okay. More like. Do we have one one more question? We can we can get into. 
Well, I had lots of questions, but Philip stole my questions about this, this, the displaying. But it had to do, like, when, on your presentation, Sophia, like, when we saw some of the pictures from installations you made, like, what is the difference? So you have images framed, hanged on the wall. So. What oh, yeah. is that was a definitely that was a much older uh, that was my first no, I'm <laughs> showcase. Um, I wish I would I should have shown uh, pictures of the last one that we did in Miami no, during. No, uh, no, our, no, but but this is this is, I think this is the question. How can mm -hmm. how can the work you do relate to the medium specificity and also the questions of how do you set it up? So you said we were having this strong discussion, strong disagreement last last <laughs> night because of the. So you show the code with the images. Otherwise, you just see some prints on the wall, what, what you do. But besides that question, I have another one. Mm -hmm. uh, during this very stimulating afternoon that I think, at least for me, it gave me a lot to think of, you were only talking about code. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the key characteristics of contemporary art is the worriness or the worries with the social, gender, climate, etc. So how come all these worries that took uh, that that are so present in contemporary art, uh, contemporary art are so absent from your from your from your work they are not absent okay. in my person they don't need to be explicit in my work mm. well, yeah, maybe um, for, for me they are. There are many projects that um, talk about these topics, mm -hmm. and but my question is: You said there, this is something very present in the contemporary art. Maybe this is not anymore contemporary art. Maybe that's that's a point here. Uh, maybe we are not anymore about the concept. Mm -hmm. I think always the art has been uh, there for that, right? But I think there is a change here with that. We were talking last night about the code or the technical complexity of the work, if it has to be shown or not, I, I don't know. But what I really believe is that centuries ago, complexity and, and, and technique was on the basis of the art. Um, not like a few weeks ago, I was talking with a friend in Madrid about uh, a drawing by Velázquez, which I personally don't like, because the aesthetics I don't like, but I, I had to understand that he just changed everything with that light and that perspective and everything, and how he aligned the family. And so it was very important for the people at that time, the technique, and he was the master of that. And But the aesthetic, or he was not provoking, he was uh, drawing what he was with he had to draw and represent like society at that time so then we moved along a lot of time and then we passed through many many different movements and the last one was the concept and the provocation and uh, the black square and then all the rest of the things right and then we are here and i really see that now there is no concept now there is this kind of who can do this for the first time, who can do the perfect code, who can... So I'm not saying it's better or worse, but maybe it just... We are not anymore in the contemporary art. Maybe it's a, a new thing. I don't know. Yeah, um, I think it's bad things to compare uh, alternative art to other... Um, to other... Yeah, I think like to contemporary art or anything else. I think generative art has its own questions, like uh, uh, what's the interaction between human and machine? Um, what can we do with the AI and stuff like that? And I think those questions, we have to define those questions first before breaking them. And so yeah, that's the whole point, because we, this is really the beginning, like even if it's like it's during we, we've been making, like people have been making this uh, for like uh, 16 years or even more. And I think it's really not that much in the, in the movement. So I think it's just ongoing thing. 
It is, it is an ongoing thing, and uh, I don't know if you're going to say something. I, I do have some thoughts. Um, I just wanted to say that there are two artists I would definitely recommend you check out. We were talking about one of them yesterday, uh, Maya Mann. Uh, she is always reflecting on her femininity and, and living in a, in, in, social, in a social media um, world and identity online, and she's constantly reflecting on uh, you know, transgender right, being, being an Asian woman in, in America. Uh, Emily, she also, her, her project did something that I thought was really wonderful in which her, her artwork using an algorithm also found a way to show her culture as an Asian woman and uh, you know, it, it reflecting on Japanese woodwork and that's something that we don't see often in generative art as I think you were trying to, to reference. Um, so I think moving forward, we are starting to see artists uh, take it, uh, it's not so much take it a step further, but just go on in the conceptual side and using their code to explain that message in, in, their, own, in their own style. Uh, but you know, I think for the most part, the idea is the visual, the, that, that visual idea is the art. Um, and so what these artists are trying to do is create a system and, and be very explicit with the computer. I think one of the key things, you will, you will respect this so much the second you try to create a circle with code. Um, like just go into, go into a, a browser and try, to, and try to create it. And I think when you see the visual outputs that a lot of these artists are creating, you can understand and connect with it on a whole other level um, where it's not so much of the, the idea or what their response is to society, but oh my goodness, your mind could create something that visually stunning. And yet, um, if you, uh, this goes back to me, it goes back a little bit to the question of how you actually display the artworks uh, so that people understand them. Because if you take an artwork, a conceptual artwork that talks about identity, for example, in the traditional contemporary art world, if, if that term even exists, um, and they only show you, for example, the painting, right? No explanation given, no context about the artist. You've got no idea what they're talking about in that work, and you believe that it's just some paint poured over a, a canvas in some cases. I'm not, I'm not saying that absolutely every uh, artwork is like that. So uh, to me, it is very important um, to find a way to um, uh, yeah, either exhibit the work with um, some e explanation, which, which happens all the time in contemporary art. Uh, there's always this, uh, I don't know, explanation about an artist, uh, their life, their story, their whatever, their, their intent with the work. Uh, so, so a lot of uh, generative art has some intent in it, or has some reflections on it that maybe don't show if you only see an image, of course. But again, it's about uh, it's about um, finding a way of uh, communicating all that with the extra difficulty that it's not just one image that you have to communicate, but rather a whole system. And actually, I do believe that a whole system may have a much higher expressive capacity to talk about issues in society, whichever issues they are and whichever issues the artist would like to address, because uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, the artist is still entitled to, do, to talk about what they want. Um, uh, generative being a tool but not just a tool, I mean, it is a tool, but again, uh, as, as uh, we were mentioning, maybe it is a new movement. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the mix of generative with uh, narrative, with uh, concept, with whatever happens, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, yields the emergence of, uh, of something that it's uh, slightly different, or very different, or... Yeah, definitely, I definitely think it will come, you know, like, like later, but the roots of the art are working with the machine and producing something with randomness, building a system. So the roots are not about communicating uh, society problems. It's about uh, interaction with the machine and how we can translate that and how we can interpret it and how we can show it to people. Even even if uh, in the, the Sophia, Sophia's presentation, Everything we saw, we don't see only one output, you know, the variable network. It's always a system that you see, and that's how you understand what she was trying to do and to communicate. So I think yeah, there's definitely a question with the displaying of the system that will, that will communicate something. But it's not, not necessarily about society. I think it will just come later. No, but I, I also think there are something uh, with society in this thing, 
because you mentioned about um, uh, environment and gender problems, and that's something that we try to target as a society for the last years. But now, actually, we have other also problems in society, which are very, very related with our relationship with machines. Our privacy, uh, the role of humans in the labor market, and many, many things right there. And that art, uh, it's, it's all about how can we communicate with the machine. And many times we can find that borders in the dialogue. I, I can just come to this point and I can, but as I mentioned before, there is a way to break these uh, walls because you are just doing art. You, you cannot, you, you don't have to explain why, you just do that. So we are facing many times these kind of problems. The thing is that maybe we are not aware of that or we are not able or we didn't find a way to express this dialogue to to the people. And that could be a great message, I, I agree. But I'm sure um, their social, um, very delicate issues in, in, in here, we can um, find a way to communicate because, um, yeah, that's the society we live now. Um. As you see, we liked your question. <laughs> Well, I think we're we're at time then. So thank you guys so much for for being thank you here. Much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>